So yeah, I think I uh, please do feel free to share the, the link to the to the tools and, and also to the video in the chat. And we're going to then take the precious two minutes that you're leaving us with to also transition to to Henry and, and Mika. Um, Henry, I think you're here already as well. Um, Bruce is also going to support you with um, PowerPoint um, sharing. It's great to have you with us here today, Mika. Um, sorry, <laughs> Henry, um, please. Um, uh, thank you. Can you can you hear me? Good morning. Yeah, we can hear you well. Okay. Uh, sorry, it's it's a bit early here in Nigeria. It's, we have close one hour GMT, so the office is not even ready. I'm actually sitting outside. Uh, so, I think I have Mika with me. So, we, like Christine said, we'll be talking about CLP, community-led project, and how we do, we have used it to encourage women participation. So I would like to give a brief overview about, of our context. So in Nigeria, not just Nigeria, mostly our, we, we dwell in an, a patriarchal system where we, women face social and cultural barriers limiting their, limiting their participation. Women are seen to be seen, not heard. Women should not be leaders by default. So this is the context we are implementing and so this is why we actually developed this approach to see if we could increase women participation and put women in position of power in position of providing for the family especially female-headed households so today i am mika would will, will be provide, presenting our achievements and what we've done so far my name is henry oji working in nic nigeria as a project coordinator for camp management and out of camp so mika would be presenting after I'm done, and we would leave time, like, I think five minutes or 10 minutes for questions. So next slide, please. So what is community-led project? Here is a picture of a, of a football field built by camp management agencies, I think in Lebanon, by NRC. This project was actually, you could see the first picture, the field was, not green, and there was no grass, there was no carpet, there was no pool post. The community requested for the youth to be engaged and given a space for football. This was built. So hand, handing over the project, design and implementation to the community based on their priorities. This is what we call community-led project, where community decide what should be done, and we hand over the resources and the project to them based on the prioritization. So basically, in the youth of toolbox, we have this template this document called problem identification and prioritization skills where you train the community on how to identify problems and how to prioritize problems so prior before you start clp i would i would actually encourage you to use the this train the community on how to identify problems and prioritize them next slide please another example of clp in afghanistan where the community requested for water water was an issue the community requested for a water tank to be installed close by so that women could actually access water. Uh, next slide. So this is, we all know this actually, the, the participation ladder where we have information, consultation, partnership on, on ownership. Uh, to really achieve ownership actually, CLP is a way to go. Uh, next slide. slide. So to truly reach ownership or participation in, through empowerment, communities should be able to make real decisions about which problems are addressed and how resources are used, and to take leadership role in designing and implementing solutions. Community-based projects can be an avenue to reach the level of participation. For a solution to be community-based, it means that it is identified and proposed by the community members themselves, and they take ownership of this solution. It means it's based on capacity within the community, and not external capacity. By taking a step back and allowing community structure to, to lead the process from the problem identification and prioritization to developing the solution and implementing this, the community structures and other community members are, are more likely to take ownership of this project. We always talk about ownership and participation and where, how far can we go when we build community structures, when we capacity build them, actually. The next step is actually allowing them to take leadership and ownership of this project. 
So the next slide. So uh, here in Nigeria, we actually had flexible funding from few donors where we developed CLP projects. We have two pilot projects. First of all, was the mostly on livelihood project where women actually act to be trained in tailoring, cap making, knitting, and co. But uh, before we did that, we had an assessment and an, an FGD to understand what are their needs and what, how do we prioritize this? But focusing on women actually, especially women headed houses, because we, we, we found out that women headed houses actually are highly vulnerable due to lack of resources and lack of capacity to really provide for the family. So the first project actually was tailoring where we identified 300 women for cap ma making, tailoring and soap make making in 10 camps. The idea is to train these women in skills over a period of time and provide them with seed money, capital to start up their local business after graduation. So these women, after training for tailoring for three months, will be provided with seed money to go off start up their personal businesses. We we actually looking forward to provide even money for renting spaces for tailoring for let's say 10 women in, in batches actually. Next slide. Together with NRC, the Women Committee prepared a project project proposal and BOQ detailing what is required and specification needed. Through community engagement, we were able to identify specialized trainers in the community who are registered and government approved to conduct this skill acquisition program. A CLP committee was set up to oversee the beneficiary selection. This committee consists of NRC staff, women representatives, and community leaders. Selection criteria were agreed upon by the community and mass awareness sessions and community engagement was conducted to educate people and raise awareness as to who would be selected and why. So critically, actually, one of the key issues was selection criteria. We had to set up a selection committee comprising of the community leaders, women representative, and NRC staff, actually. Why I said community leaders, for you to have any buy-in, for you to really have success in your project here in Nigeria, actually, you have to have the support of the leadership structures of the camp, every camp. Next slide. The second project, actually, this was at the, the result of a request from CFM. We have uh, a lot of women-headed households and women, uh, young adult women who do not have education. Uh, like I earlier said in our context, women are not allowed, actually really encouraged to go to school and further their education. So in some of our camps, actually, we received requests to support voluntary adult education trainings. So the women came in groups, women in groups, and started teaching the women who were former teachers or women who had experience in education, were teaching the other women how to read and write. NRC system received a request to support voluntary teachers who conducted evening classes to teach women how to speak and write English in one of our camps. This adult education class is targeted women from the camp and host community. And having been suffering from lack of funding and resources as it, as it was voluntary and safe funded from retired teachers, NRC engaged women community members and community leaders through FGD and meetings to understand the impact and importance of the adult education and benefits to women education. NRC through community-led projects is providing educational materials such as books, pens, boards, and other requested materials, while also referring and advocating for support for education partners, education projects to educate to education partners and government ministries of women affairs and education, who would be able to provide a more comprehensive education package. So, Basically, we are not education partners and we there's a limit to what we could do. So we are providing materials right now and we are in the process of engaging other education partners and the Ministry of Women Affairs and to see how we can actually take this further. Next slide. So I would like to, like to discuss about the challenges actually for we face a lot of challenges during the planning, during the implementation. Mind you, actually, we handed over the resources to the community. And if you are dealing with community that has low literacy level, that has greed and corruption and, and the community, interfer community leaders' interference, 
you would be faced with a lot of challenges actually. The first challenge is uh, listed here was to identify specialized trainers who are locally trained. So you could find trainers who are government approved, but they are not within the community, they are not close by, or they, they do not have the understanding of the context. So for it to be really community led, we actually agreed for the community to identify localized trainers. But we, are, we realized that when the community identified local trainers, these trainers were not registered. And part of the, law, the Borno State law and the government of Nigerian law is for you, for NGOs to do business with any organization, that organization must be registered fully licensed and approved and tax paying. So it was a challenge for us to really balance between local acceptance and local ownership and government bureaucracy. Uh, I think we repeated this. Okay, finding a balance between organization policy and community ownership actually, because you'd have to really justify your processes. If you are handing over these resources to the city, what are your, how do you monitor and evaluate? How do you do, how do you check in if they are doing the right thing actually? And bear in mind, you do not want to over interfere, you do not want to lead to that it should be community led. So we had to do a lot of mechanisms internally to support this process because it was not the case before. My, this was the first time we are doing this. So we had to do a lot of waivers, a lot of justification memos to actually explain what we are doing and to cover our, 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 our own side in case of when there is an is a evaluation after the process. The next one was beneficiary selection and managing expectations. So we are in a context where this crisis has protracted. Everybody, we have many people in need. We have so many female-headed households, and even the men want to benefit. How do you manage this process? How do you inform those? How do you let others know why they were not selected, actually? So we had to use a, a three-prone approach where we engage the community leaders, we engage the women lead women groups, and actually we did mass sensitization and awareness projects, actually reaching the community through various means, educating them on how the process was done. And if you are not selected now, then we would have the second phase. The first phase is to identify 300 women who will be trained. And in the long run, these women should be able to train other community members. So we actually really had to go back and forth educating the, the community who would be selected. Then, the other one, which was very important and key, was community leaders' interference in project planning and beneficiary selection, actually. The community leaders would always want to interfere. They would always want to provide the names of their wives, their family members, their daughters, because they think they want to be seen as people of power. So managing their, their influence and, and interest, actually, was very key. When you use the stakeholders analysis and mapping, you would understand, in our context, the, the men, actually, the community leaders, actually, can be some at sometimes of negative influence and impact your projects. So we actually really need to really had to engage the community leaders and actually educate them that this should be community led. This should be women led. It was a very difficult task asking the men to actually take a seat and allow women to take charge. It was very very funny at the first sight. They said no no no. We it was a, they used religion. They used culture. But we had to really engage them back and forth for this. Next slide. So lessons learned actually. Using the CLP project beneficiary selection guidelines in chapter four of the CCT, NRC team in collaboration with the community leaders and women representative groups came up with an acceptable selection criteria. NRC CCM team role was to ensure the engagement of women and marginalized groups. Uh, we use the selection beneficiary selection guideline from the CCT toolbox, but we actually tried not to really interfere, actually. We trained the women on, on the guideline, we educated the women on the guideline, and told them, okay, these are the rules and regulations, this is what you cannot do, but the process must be led by you. They, they selected the committee, they, they selected their leaders, and so they led this. In your plan, actually, you have to be very, very flexible, because you'd be, you'd be faced with a lot, a lot of challenges, a lot of unforeseen, actually. So you should be able to adapt as you go. You might have a perfect idea in your head, but when you come to implement it, a lot of things come, you have to tweak and adapt your approach. Ensure to engage all major stakeholders early on, especially community leaders, religious leaders and main groups who often times can be an opposition to the women engagement. So if your context is like mine, actually, I would encourage you really to engage the men and the community leaders ahead of time. 
early on in the planning phase of the project, engage them, seek their consent, take their inputs, really make them part of the team, actually. You need them on your side than against you. Capacity building and effective communication is required to mitigate against both cultural and social barriers limiting women engagement in our context. Especially engaging community leaders in dialogue and open conversation is required to gain the trust and buy in into projects only targeting women in the community. It's very important actually to really engage them, educate them and capacity build the women because for certain women, it is norm for them. They expect their husbands to tell them what to do and who, what to do. They, they have to think the concept of their husbands to go to the market. They have to think the concept of their husbands to actually attend meetings. So you really have to educate both men and the women actually. Engaging the community on, on really actually, if you are using uh, trainers who are not from the community or who, had, who have facilities outside the community actually, it is really required for you to engage both women leaders and men leaders to go and see the facilities because the men would say, no, no, my wife cannot leave the camp. She cannot move far away to go and get trained. So you, we, we had this idea to take the men to go see these facilities and ensure that the trainers would be women. They would not, be, would not allow men to train women. So we would, would actually use women to train women. Uh, I think, uh, next slide. I think this should be uh, the end of my presentation. I would be allowing Mika to continue. And if you have any questions, you could keep it after Mika's presentation, then we would answer all the questions together. Thank you. Mika, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Henry. Uh, I'll pick up from there. I hope, am I audible? You are, Mika. Can, can you hear me? You have just 15 minutes as well. Yeah, we can. Yeah, all right, so. Okay, okay, so I'll, I'll speed up. Uh, next slide. Yes, um, Henry talked more about the uh, whole conceptualization of community-led projects, uh, so I will not dwell much on it. Uh, but, uh, I'll just highlight that uh, at the beginning of the process, we had a training for, for the staff. So we combined both uh, NRC staff and uh, IAM staff, and we took them through the toolkit. Um, and we did also a, a mock process of, of uh, identifying uh, problem identification, uh, problem analysis and so forth so to equip the staff uh, ahead of the um, actual implementation of the community-led projects. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, initially what we did, we uh, had consultations uh, with, the, with the government, uh, both at the system sector working group level and at, uh, at the level of camp managers to get their buy-in in, into the process. And um, internally within IOM, we allocated um, uh, focal points that we're going to uh, champion this uh, implementation of the project. Um, we also uh, put in place some uh, work plans so that we'd ensure that key stages were being followed uh, in the implementation of, of, the, of, of the project. We emphasized on uh, documentation so that we could have uh, trails uh, of the process. We also uh, put in place um, uh, some competent interpreters uh, because the uh, affected populations in Northeast Nigeria uh, are so diverse. So, and there are multiple languages that are being spoken. So we had to identify competent uh, interpreters uh, ahead of time. Next slide, please. So just uh, examples of the uh, community-led projects for Northeast Nigeria. We have uh, const construction of local uh, drainage channels, or clean up of existing drainage channels, clean up of sites, ex excavation of waste, uh, waste disposal pits, uh, also nutrition gardens, uh, repair of infrastructure, repair of shelters for EVIs and persons with specific needs, and livelihood projects for youth and women, which have already been uh, mentioned by Henry. Next slide. So uh, this is one project that we did in a site called uh, Custom House, uh, where we provided uh, the community with tools 
and the uh, constructed local drainage. So this is uh, one of the sites which uh, floods perennially, but um, uh, the community were able to come up with a local drainage solution and uh, we were only able to provide them with tools and they organize themselves and uh, they dug these uh, drainage channels. Next, next slide. So in implementing the, the project, we faced uh, various challenges. So as already highlighted the issue of multiple languages that are spoken by the affected populations. Uh, so we had to use uh, multiple interpreters uh, to address this. Then also, uh, as already highlighted by, by Henry, uh, there are literacy challenges as well among the affected populations. Uh, uh, utilizing the problem tree analysis was very difficult to conduct for some sites. And uh, to, in order to avoid this, we had to use uh, open discussions. Uh, and uh, this, we, we, di we didn't record this, but in future, if other agencies are to use open discussions, they will be need to record these open discussions for, for documentation purposes. Uh, some of the communities failed to agree on prioritization of problems to be tackled. And um, in, in, in such a stalemate, we had to uh, split uh, these groups. Uh, to, in order to have progress. Uh, there was also domination of men in some of the discussions due to the deeply patriarchal setup of society. So our facilitators had to accommodate women and ensure that their opinions were being expressed at all the critical stages. And also lack of confidence from women in expressing themselves as well uh, due to this uh, historical uh, background uh, whereby they are just looked down upon and so forth. But um, our facilitators encouraged, encouraged women to contribute through various means, uh, which includes maybe involving the movement of women in key support functions like translations. And also in one of the uh, locations, we had a challenge uh, securing land. Um, the IDPs uh, identified the project which was tied to securing land. So securing land proved to be a, a, big, a big problem and we had to go for an, uh, an alternative uh, project. Next slide. Uh, securing a, a buy-in uh, from the government is, is critical. Um, uh, with us, one of the big lessons learned. Securing buy-in from the government is crucial. And uh, for our context, you uh, get a a, a confidence from the community in the process if, if, if you have had a buy-in from the government because the nature of the society is that they trust their leaders so much. So if you have not secured a buy-in from the government, you have a challenge in implementing the project. Uh, there, there is also a need to uh, have deliberate measures to bolster uh, uh, confidence of women for them to participate in the context of uh, deeply patriarchal society. So leadership training, is crucial and needs to be regular. And also refresher trainings for women leaders on their roles and responsibilities is also important. Uh, and changes in societal attitudes take a long time and need to involve use of multiple strategies. The content in sensitization sessions and the methods used need to be diversified to ensure that it's not uh, monotonous. Great, greater effort has to be exerted for men to understand the importance of uh, women participation in a in deeply patriarchal society. So the men uh, need to be heavily involved in the process as well. Uh, the project staff also need to include both women and men. And for IOM, all project staff included both women and men. And this point has been highlighted by, by Henry as well, whereby he, he, he said that uh, they developed a strategy of using women to train women because uh, the men would find it more acceptable. So you need to have like the gender balance within the project team. Next slide. So the religious and cultural norms that may inhibit women participation need to be mapped out from the beginning and strategies crafted on how to tackle them. For example, men and women not being allowed to sit in one meeting or women not being allowed to talk during a public meeting when there's a large number of men. So you need to map out these religious and cultural norms ahead of times. And uh, meetings have to be arranged at suitable times so that women can attend. Uh, due consideration have to be given to uh, traditional chores that women play. 
then uh, uh, women need to be given some key roles during the project. Uh, uh, women need to begin the planning stage where uh, 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 particular tasks that can be done by women need to be identified so that you ensure that they are, they are full involvement. Um, and also lastly, there's need to uh, invest in uh, communication uh, with affected populations, particularly language support. Uh, usage of appropriate languages ensures that women are not relying on men for them to understand the processes and the content being delivered. So the interpretation and, uh, it, and translation into local languages must be of good quality. And for, for IOM, IOM was able to leverage on its partnership with Translators Without Borders, which has been providing language support services in Northeast Nigeria. So from, from my side, uh, this is all. Uh, so I've had to uh, rush through. So uh, I leave this time for, for any questions so that we can clarify uh, any issues that needs to be clarified. Sorry if I made you rush that, uh, Mika. You still have um, six minutes in your session, uh, Henry and Mika, if, if there are any questions also. Um, I see a lot of um, comments also appreciating the fact that you, know, you share challenges um, you face as well during this process. Um, and I think it's always good and always make the presentation that much richer to also understand the, the challenges that you, that you face um, in this process. Um, Maybe if I could ask um, a question. Um, <clears throat> so thanks, uh, Henry and Mika, for that presentation. That was really uh, interesting. Um, I'm a really big advocate and fan of uh, community-led projects. I think they're a very important tool for any sort of camp manager in the camps, um, uh, you know, to utilize as part of their community engagement sort of programming. They're, they're incredibly flexible. Um, and I, I really like the way that you highlighted some of the lessons learned and challenges <clears throat> in your particular context. I was wondering, could you elaborate a bit maybe on, you know, did you, did you have a sort of like standing operating procedure for implementation of the, of the community led projects, sort of like what project criteria did you narrow it down to for the community? Or did you have a sort of like blank slate for them to pick certain projects from um, when you're doing the engagement. Okay, uh, Mika, can I start? So uh, basically, we developed a, a very simple and um, uh, flexible SOP, but we didn't actually identify projects you could do. We first of all did an, an assessment to identify, to ask the community through FGD and through KI what could be done actually. So they listed over over 20 different opportunities and, and, and activities. Then we came back to them and said, okay, can you narrow this down? After we had this community training on problem identification and prioritization, so we asked them to narrow this down to, more, to at least four projects, which could be done. So like Mika said, in some communities, we could not get a consensus. In some communities, we got, we got consensus. So we tried not to actually really interfere so much. And we believed it should be community led. But what we, we did have, have an SOP, which was really open and trying to, which is more about a guideline than an SOP actually, on activities to be done. And what did you do when, when the community couldn't reach consensus on, on what projects to, to, to pick? Okay, like Mika said, in, in some communities, we, we had to split because uh, I, like I earlier said, you should have a flexible funding actually. You should have flexible funding to really do this. Uh, so we had to split these two, and in, in some areas we told them, okay, can we, since it is, we have four, can we do these two now, then do the other two in the next phase? Because mind you, we told them this would be done in phases, actually. We are in phase one now. We would have phase two in the next three months. So in the next three months, we would prioritize the second list of activities they identified. Okay, great. Um, great. I have a question also from Jennifer on um, like, do you think the trainers can also be engaged for more topics linked to CCCM and which languages are your tools translated into? Uh, from, from IM side, uh, uh, we didn't translate the, the tools as it were, uh, but we, we narrowed the content to local languages so that it, we could converse easily with the affected populations. 
is that does that Jen, does that do you want to clarify? Okay, uh, can I say something? Of course. Uh, for, the, uh, for the trainers, actually, uh, uh, yes, uh, we could actually really train them more on, on CCCM, other CCCM topics, actually, maybe, but we have to really try to balance it because these trainers actually are private businesses which are duly registered in the community. So it's, it's trying to find the balance to really find time to train them. But we definitely, they went through the code of conduct training and and PSCA training, ba really basic trainings for the for humanitarian response. And like Mika said, we did not translate these tools. We used interpreters actually because it would take a lot of time to translate for us. So we just used interpreters from the community, local community. Thank you. That that clarifies a lot. But I like what you said, Henry, um, about how they were trained in train, doing training in PSCA and on code of conduct and um humanitarian principles and i do think that there's a relevance back to that even if they are um private businesses i mean i think that that's just a workaround like you were talking about in the beginning so could you just mention which languages okay so in this context we have hausa and kanuri which are the two predominant languages like Mika said, we have so several languages here in, in our contest, but the two major languages is Hausa and Kanuri. So whatever you're translating should be translated to Hausa and Kanuri. All right, perfect. And thank you so much, Henry and Mika, for taking us through um, the process that you've taken in on this big long journey that I think a lot of us are, are also on, I think. Um, and, and I think also for, um, for Kristen um, and for Ingrid and Mun Mun, I think this like, it's become quite a mini sessions around participation, engaging with communities. Um, and I think, you know, it's all like, we're also working towards this um, like community led um, like projects and engagement and decision making process in the camps.